not recommend 10 out of 10. I uh, thought about getting one. I'm like, I don't know if I want people to see me like that. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be professional. Um, you know. Oh, I like your square, your True Consequences podcast square. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you how to do that later. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Let me see. Hi, Dr. Shiloh. Hi, Dr. Shiloh. I'm never going to stop following you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, yeah, Dr. Shiloh, I have to send you an email, too, by the way. Um, I think I'm ready for your uh, expert analysis on my father's conversation. Just, just saying. Ooh, that'll yeah. be good. Oh, my gosh. So good, but so nerve-wracking. Okay. Just making sure we're set up on our different platforms here. It's so cool how it casts to other um, avenues here, but it's it's also nerve-wracking. It's a little bit of a logistical nightmare, too, trying to – people commenting, and I'm like, I don't know. I can't <laughs> – I can't multitask. <laughs> yeah. 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 When I, you know, I keep, I try to remember to remind people that if they're listening on, you know, other uh, streams that they have to come to get vocal to ask questions. Um, it's just a lot easier, but yeah. All right. Let's see. Mm-mm. Yeah, while I'm setting everything up, how is everybody doing tonight? I see some regulars. Let me see. I see some new faces. Oh, my gosh. Dr. Shiloh, let's do it. You're the best. <laughs> Eric, have you spoken to Dr. Shiloh before, like on the phone or? No, I have. Well, I've been on a Get Vocal stream with Dr. Shiloh, but never spoken. Would love oh. to. Oh, perfect then. She's amazing. Oh my goodness. We were supposed Before to Before she files a restraining order against me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's all of us on Get Vocal. We just like stalk each other on here. It's absolutely <laughs> fine. Absolutely it's fun. Fine. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We have eight people on YouTube. Hi, everybody on YouTube. Get stalked. <laughs> Get stalked. Oh my gosh. I love it. Um, well, and thank you so much for canceling your stream to be here on my stream tonight. My goodness, that was extremely uh, kind of you. Well, I think you're doing me the kindness and you understand probably more than most people how important it is to get your sibling story out there. And um, I just really appreciate you doing this. Um, I've told you before, and I'm going to say it publicly here, that you are a personal hero of mine and, and you're the reason why I had the courage to start sharing my brother's story so thank you oh my gosh okay we have to get all into that all into that because i yeah I heard a lot of podcast things i wanted to talk to you about for sure okay great um okay sorry i signed into youtube and it unsigned me out of my google docs with my notes which is just lovely um But no, like you literally inspire me. So I don't know what you're talking about, sir. <laughs> Stop it. You do. And I, we're going to talk about all that. I can't wait. Like, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm so nervous to interview you. I'm not even going to lie. Because I feel like you deserve the best in the world. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'm that. I don't know if I'm that. So <laughs> <laughs> you sell yourself short. Oh, you're so sweet. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Jolene. Sorry, everybody. This is a thousand percent my fault. This is no reflection of Eric or his wonderful podcast, True Consequences. <laughs> we'll blame YouTube. How about that? There we go. Yeah, YouTube is being a jerk. All right. Fern, you're too nice. Sarah and her seamless plug. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, Maggie says, good interview the other day at the library. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I did uh, live at, at a library. Well, uh, virtually. It is really nerve wracking. I've never done anything like that. Um, so it was very interesting. That's cool. I should connect you with them, actually, Eric. I'm sure that they would love to feature you. Sure. Um, okay. Come on. Okay. I think I'm all situated. Sorry, it's okay. we're three minutes late, everybody. Um, but yeah, so I, I want to welcome everybody to today's live stream. Um, today I have Eric 
who is the host of the True Consequences podcast. Um, and I actually met Eric because he featured Alyssa's story on his podcast as well. Um, but more importantly, we are here to talk about the case of his brother, Jacob. Um, so I just want to say uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. Of course. Um, and I, I just want to ask you to give everybody who isn't familiar with Jacob's case a high level overview of what it is and, and what you're doing. Sure. So um, 33 years ago, my brother died and there was there was an investigation that happened. It was I would say it was thorough. I don't know that it was 100 percent handled properly, but it was thorough. Um, it was very clear. I found this out later who was responsible for his death. Um, he was murdered. He was only nine months old. He was a baby. So this is it's a tough case for a lot of people to hear. Uh, it's a tough case to talk about. And uh, I'll warn you that I might get emotional. I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve and I can start crying on the drop of a dime. Uh, so I apologize in advance for that. <clears throat> but um, the person responsible has never been charged. He was never prosecuted. Um, in fact, he does not have a criminal record at all, which for me is a red flag, um, but we can get into that later. Uh, he was a nightmare of a human being, and he tormented myself and my mother for years after my brother died. Um, and we didn't really find out the truth about what happened until much later, but um, it it's all... It's all suspicious. It's all crazy. It's all, you know, everything. I don't know. Uh, I feel like I'm doing a terrible job at this high level overview. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I, I think high level overviews are hard, especially when there's as yeah. many details in, in the case as your brother's. Um, yeah. So, no, you're doing great. You're doing absolutely okay. great. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, right now, what I'm doing is, um, like I said before, Sarah inspired me to tell my brother's story on my show which was something that I was resistant to doing in the beginning. And um, now what I'm trying to do is to get more attention to his case because it is cold. Um, it is considered closed according to the police right now. Um, and that's because the district attorney refuses to prosecute the case. Uh, he cites several reasons, which I don't really know if those are, are valid or not. So I have created a petition to ask the attorney general to reopen the case um, because that's my only like Hail Mary last ditch effort. If the attorney general refuses, then I really have nowhere else to go at that point. And it's, it's highly likely that, that I may never see justice for my brother. But what I've committed to uh, for my mother and and for people that are close to me is that if that's the case, then I'm going to fight to change whatever laws have prevented my brother from getting justice so that this doesn't happen to anybody else in New Mexico ever again. I love that. I love that. That's absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you, Fern. So Fern actually just linked um, the podcast in the Get Vocal, or I'm sorry, the petition in the Get Vocal chat there. So everybody, please sign the petition. Um but I, I want to step back for a second, and if it's okay with you, I just want to talk a little bit about how Jacob died, because when I started reading everything, I couldn't believe what was in the, the report and the official story from this person of interest, or I guess, can we call him a suspect? I feel like I read, you sent me some documents, and I feel like he was called a suspect. Yeah, he was the suspect. He was the primary suspect. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was going through the reports and listening to you. You have three wonderful episodes on your um, podcast, True Consequences, that, that go over this story. And you talk to a prosecutor from New Mexico, and it's really well done. And there's a ton of information there. Um, but again, I, I saw so many red flags when I heard this suspect's official story. And um, mm -hmm. if you guys aren't familiar, we aren't naming the suspect. We will not do that. It's something Eric has chosen not to do. Um, as far as I still know, you're, you're still not naming him. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't want to risk prosecution uh, of him in this situation just because he hasn't been charged uh, and he hasn't been officially named publicly. I don't want to do anything to jeopardize the case. Yeah, and that's fair. And I completely respect and understand where you're coming from. I don't think I would have named my father as, you know, the person of interest if ABC 2020 didn't do it 10 years ago or whatever. 
So I totally right. get it. Um, but again, going back to Jacob. So the official story was that Jacob fell off a couch, right? And maybe hit his head on a coffee table. And then about 30 minutes later, he was, um, there was fluid coming out of his, I believe his ears and his nose that was yellow, that was uh, determined to be uh, brain fluid. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Um, yeah, that, that was the first story that he gave police. Right. Yes. And I, yes. And he changes his story many times is my understanding. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I said, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm like ultra respectful. I just, I, I feel for you so much. Um, but I, there were so many things that really triggered me with those, with that first official story, like just some of the logistics, even like the fact that he says that the, the couch that um, Jacob fell off of was like two and a half feet high. Mm -hmm. um, which seems really high. Like I'm just over five feet tall. So that's almost half of my body is, is this uh, height of the couch. I mean, was the couch that high or, I mean, I don't, I don't remember it being that high. And, and I was, I think I was six and I remember being able to sit on that couch without any problem. And I think if I was six and it was two and a half feet high, I would probably need help to get up on it. Like that's pretty tall. Yeah. So, the, I mean, that might be a small detail. And I do get hung up on small details, so please forgive me. I just go into no, it's okay. crazy research mode. Um, so that really, really stood out to me. Um, and, I mean, just the entire story and the fact that he, you know, he kind of blamed it on you. You know, he had said that you were jealous of your brother and you kicked the baby like six months, or I'm sorry, a month prior um, to his death. Mm -hmm. which, you know, you later, can, I mean, can you just talk a little bit about that before I speak for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I remember this very clearly and I think a lot of people get shocked when they hear that. Um, but I remember most of what happened. Um, I probably have some fuzzy details in there, but I, I don't remember being jealous of my brother ever. I remember being jealous of his name. I remember thinking that he had a prettier name than me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was upset about that. And my grandma told me that my name meant princely. And so I was like, oh, all right. Well, I'm good with it now because I'm a prince and, you know, whatever. Um, so I remember that. But I don't remember. I prayed for my brother um, when I was like four. I was praying that my mom would have a kid uh, and that it would be a boy. And so he was my little miracle brother. And I loved him so much. Um, I remember him being this crazy little kid that was a daredevil and wasn't afraid of anything and had this crazy sense of humor. And he was only like eight, nine months old at the time, but he was just so full of life and so full of joy. So I don't remember ever being jealous or wanting to hurt him. So I'll start by saying that. Um, but I also have always been a people pleaser, uh, especially when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And so my stepdad at the time, he claimed that I was jealous of my brother, that I kicked him in the head, and and that resulted in the first injury that happened, which was uh, a subdural hematoma that required to be lanced and drained. Um, there were a bunch of other strange injuries that started to happen through, you know, as time progressed. Um, weird things started to happen, like there were sunflower seed shells in his crib. Um, he started to have bruises on his body. He would get unexplained injuries and then his reactions to things that he used to love. Like he used to love sitting on people's shoulders and, you know, being thrown around and cause he was crazy. Uh, he started to be really afraid of that. Like so terrified that he would start screaming and crying and clutching on to my mom. So there were a lot of red flags about what was happening to him. And, um, my stepdad did blame me. So my mom, partially because, you know, I don't think that she necessarily believed that I was hurting my brother, but I think she was trying to get me out of the situation to protect me. She sent me with my, to live, live with my dad in California. And that was about a month before Jacob died. And the injuries did not stop. Things kept happening to him. So, um, I just don't put a lot of stock in him claiming that I, I hurt my brother. And even if I did, I don't think that a six year old would have the strength to cause an injury that would require him to have his brain fluid drained. No. Like that doesn't seem possible. 
No, and I don't have children myself, but I have babysat children my entire life. I used to work in the baby industry, which meant I, I spent a lot of time talking to moms. And, you know, people feel really regretful when their babies accidentally get hurt. So I would hear stories of kids falling off the changing table was, you know, the number one story you'd hear. And I mean, if if a baby had to go to the hospital every time he fell off a couch and hit a coffee table, there would be babies in the hospital left and right. My goodness. I mean, babies are so bouncy and resilient and things just happen. Babies get dropped. Babies fall. Um, so I think that their bodies are conditioned to deal with that type of trauma. Um, but, yeah. but to your point, the injuries didn't stop after you were gone and he had prior injuries. Um, that mm -hmm. was another thing that stood out to me. So, you know, Jacob is rushed to the hospital, essentially. And what I read in the reports that you sent me was that the hospital staff immediately thought this was child abuse. Like there's more than one um, a note of that in the report. So it's it's just insane to me that nothing happened at all at this point. Um, but I think it's so glaringly obvious that it was something done, obviously not by a six-year-old. It had to have been done by a full-grown man. And I, I think I remember something to the effect of your in your podcast of um, them saying that they believed that it was a, a man-sized hand that had hit his head. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, I think that the um, medical investigator said that the official cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Uh, that looked like it could be about the size of a man's ha open hand on his head, that the injury was about that size. Um, and so that whole thing, so I'm in California and my mom is working, she's working at a grocery store. We're from a small town in New Mexico. Um, my grandmother is watching my brother. My mom had since limited any interactions that Jacob was having with her boyfriend at the time uh, by himself because she started to have suspicions that he was hurting him. And so it's about an hour before she's about to get off of work. My grandmother calls her and says, hey, I want to go to church. What do I do with Jacob? My mom says, you know, it's an hour. What's going to happen? What could happen in an hour? Um, go ahead and take him to my boyfriend. And I think it was less than an hour, maybe half an hour after dropping Jacob off that he runs into her job, um, panicked. The ambulance is driving by really fast to the hospital. And he's, you know, saying to my mom that my brother's unconscious and he doesn't know what's happening. Um, right. So that whole thing is just crazy. Um, if you hear a bunch of noise in the background, I'm sorry, my son is playing Xbox and he's really loud. Uh, so <laughs> typ typical teenager. Yeah. Um, so my brother was airlifted to Albuquerque, which is about 75 miles away from where we lived because his injuries were so severe that they couldn't treat them uh, in my hometown. And he went in for emergency surgery and he passed away shortly after that. I flew back from California with my dad and was immediately taken into a police interview room and, and interrogated by the state police. Oh, wow. At six years old, at six, right? At six years old. Yeah. Do you remember what they, or do you have reports? I don't remember seeing it in there. I'm sorry if I missed it, um, about what they I, asked you. Yeah, they asked me uh, a couple questions. The first question they asked me was if I had ever hurt my brother. And uh, I said no, and I got really agitated. And they asked me if I knew who hurt my brother. I think Fern knows this better than I do because I my memory is like terrible. Uh, same, same. But trauma. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I I got really agitated and said I didn't know. And then the other thing I need to talk about. I'm sorry. Before I get there is before I was taken into the police interview room, uh, my stepdad pulled me aside and said, "Don't lie. Don't you lie. You know what happens to people who lie." Uh, which was very threatening, obviously. obviously. Yes, absolutely. My goodness. Uh, so the police, you know, they, they suspected that what he was saying hadn't been true. And, um, they asked me if he had ever hit me and I said, no, but he acts like he's going to a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, think and I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. 
I was gonna say that was the end of the interview. Oh yeah, I, I just wanted to speak um, to the fact that he, I mean, it seems like he manipulated you quite a bit as a child. And as a six year old, my goodness, it's extremely easy to do. Um, but I believe there was an incident in which um, he kind of made you tell your mom that you were hurting Jacob and that mm -hmm. you remember that being a lie. Can you speak a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so as the pressure starting to build on him about what's going on with Jacob's injuries, he starts to create this story um, and trying to convince my mom. And he's, he was always very manipulative from the beginning. Um, he, you know, just like a typical domestic violence perpetrator, he love bombed us in the beginning. He seemed like the most amazing, charming person you've ever met. Uh, I was really enamored with him. I like, he has a really cool car. He likes good movies. He likes good music. This guy's really cool. Uh, I mean, what six year old boy wouldn't be excited about that? Exactly. And so, and so he, similar to what he said to me with the police, you know, he was really kind of holding my feet to the fire to get me to admit that I had hurt my brother. And I kind of remember this a little bit. I don't really remember a lot of it. I remember crying a lot yeah. and feeling very confused. Um, so I did admit it, you know, because he was pressuring me to. And that's when my mom sent me to California. But he he just was really good at getting people to to do what he wanted them to and to say what he wanted them to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at that with full grown adults with, you know, lots of education and lots of conditioning that they get to falsely confess to these crimes. My goodness, you were six. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you just wanted it to be over with and you just said yes because you were done with it. Um, that makes total sense. And being a people pleaser, you know, I don't want to cause conflict, so I'm going to take the path of least resistance. And if it means I'm taking the rap for something I didn't do, I'll do it. Yeah. Which is commonly which, seen in those types of situations with trauma yeah. and child abuse and things like that. There is um, often a child that tries to kind of make everyone happy and distract them from some of the, the worst things that are going on in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My goodness. That was definitely my role. Um, so it, it's pretty clear reading the case. I'm sure you, got to the same conclusion that he he was not telling the truth, that he was um, responsible. One of the things that the doctor that was treating my brother noted in the case file was that as my brother's in surgery, all or right before he goes into surgery, all he's talking about is this doesn't look good for me. I can't believe what's happening. This looks terrible for me. He's never he never once asked, uh, is Jacob okay? Is Jacob going to make it? He never once showed any ounce of concern for Jacob. He was only concerned with how this looked for him. Yes, I remember the doctor said something to the effect of um, he deals with a lot of patients and a lot of situations like this, and he hadn't seen someone more concerned about himself than the, the child that was hurt. It was something to that effect. Um, and of course, yeah. that really stood out to me. Another thing that kind of stood out to me was the fact that this nine-month-old is airlifted without someone with him. Like, why didn't your stepfather go with him to make sure that everything was okay? Like this nine month old went to this hospital alone. Yeah. Does he ever yeah. talk about that or explain that? No, no, he doesn't. And it, it's baffling. I, I know that they wouldn't let my mom on the, on the helicopter. Okay. Um, so, so I'm guessing they probably would not have let him on there either or in it, in it, I guess is the right way to say that. Um, so I, I think that was probably part of the policy or maybe they had too many people in there or whatever. Um, and yeah. So from that point, you know, the investigation starts and they ask him uh, point blank if he was responsible for this. Mm -hmm. And he gave the first story of Jacob falling off the couch and Fern, I might need your help remembering the <laughs> other stories, but um, the second story I think was uh, he was lying. Okay, the first, I'm sorry, the first story he said he sat Jacob on the couch because Jacob was getting fussy and needed to be put down for a nap and he was dubbing some cassette tapes. And so what, the tapes had clicked, so he was going to go change them, flip them over to side B or whatever. If you're under 30, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and as, as he did that, Jacob fell off the couch, hit his head on the coffee table. And that's when he said, you know, he started having stuff coming out of his ears. 
And there was another story he gave that he was kind of throwing Jacob around, playing with him, and Jacob's head hit an armchair. Mm -hmm. And that's how he got injured. Um, and, and this is within a matter of a few days. He's changed the story. Um, the third story he gave, he was lying on his back. Jacob was lying on his neck for some reason. Like, that's not a thing that happens, I don't think. Not even like a tummy um, time thing, no. Yeah, yeah. And he got up suddenly and hit Jacob's head with his head. Um, Which again, isn't and then there was one more catastrophic industry um, injury. It's just not. I've had a million kids headbutt me. It's what happens. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> insane. Um, so that that was the other thing is those the first two stories that he described were considered uh, sharp force trauma, and Jacob's injuries were blunt force trauma. So even if that did happen. That's not what caused Jacob's death. Right. That's, I mean, the fact that he's changing his story so much is obviously a huge red flag. I think we see that in a mm -hmm. lot of cases in which that person is guilty. I'm just going to say it. Like, yeah. my dad changed his story something like 15 times or something insane. And it's just, if you're telling the truth, the story doesn't change that much, especially how it happened. It might be a slight variance because your memory is a little bit different, but it's not going to be that dramatic in terms of what happened. Um, yeah. And I just, I can't believe that when he went to the hospital, he also had like the, a broken, was it bruised or a broken rib as well? He had a fractured rib that was healing. Fra yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is that they could tell immediately that your poor brother had suffered abuse for quite some time. Um, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and he tried to say that I picked my brother up out of the crib and dropped him on the floor, which Part of that story, too, doesn't make any sense because he said that he left me, a six-year-old, alone with my nine-month-old brother. How do you get into the crib? You're, like, three feet tall. Like right. <laughs> and and why are you going to leave a six-year-old to babysit a nine-month-old? Right. Which, I mean, stranger things have happened in the 80s, right? Like, it is it is a different time. And I could see a lot of kids that are six taking on that responsibility. But I'm thinking of the actual logistic of you trying to reach into that crib even if it's a drop side crib, I don't be able, I, I just don't see you being able to really maneuver the crib in that way, being that small. Well, and he was 20 pounds at that mm -hmm. point. And I probably weighed 27 pounds because I was super skinny and little. Yeah. Uh, and he was giant. He was a giant baby. So I don't think I would have been able to pick him up anyway. Yeah. I, in general. Mom said he was like 10 pounds when he was born, right? Yeah, he was huge. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, and he brings up a good point about you being interviewed by the police without your mom present. Was your mom in the room or were you totally alone? My dad was there. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. That's fair. My dad was there. Um, Fern says, and they say the rib fracture and initial head injury likely happened at the same time. Yeah. That's a lot of trauma for a little kid. Again, I've seen a lot of kids with like broken arms, falling off a changing table and stuff, but to have it in so many different areas of their body is, is just indicative of, of abuse. And it's just so sad. Um, yeah. And one of the things that <clears throat> according to the attorney or the district attorney that doomed this case was he believed my mom changed her story. And if you read the case file and if you listen to my episodes, you'll, you'll see that that's really not what happened at all. Um, what happened was that night when they're doing the initial investigation, she was asked if she felt that he was capable of doing this to my brother. And she said, I don't think so. Which is fair. We didn't think so. He seemed like a great guy. Um, she didn't know what to think. And so Fast forward to three years later after she married him and we lived with him and he tortured us and strangled her and almost killed her um, and did a bunch of other horrible things. Now she believes he's capable of it because he proved that mm -hmm. he proved that he was capable. And so the district attorney, because she was going through a divorce and because she was filing a restraining order and all this stuff was happening, did the whole like you're just a bitter woman who's trying to make your ex-husband's life hell thing. And I'm not going to do anything about it because you changed your story. That's so insane to me. I have experienced something similar in Alyssa's case. I've had the police kind of question why I changed my story, despite it literally coming from them. Right. 
So I share that frustration with you and you, you don't have to go into everything right now, but I do want to encourage people to listen to those three episodes on your podcast because the interview with your mom makes me cry every single time. And she is so open and so honest. And I just commend her so much because she's not afraid to talk about any of it. She talks about how you saved her life as a six-year-old. Like I, I just forever encourage people to listen to those episodes um, because your mom seems like, like a warrior. And like, she of course feels terrible and that she's trying to do what she can to, to rectify the situation. If, if, if I remember that correctly. Yeah. Um, and that was the first time we ever sat down and talked about all of it. We, we just never talked about it because a number of reasons, I mean, it's really painful to talk about, um, you know, as you can imagine, my mom has severe PTSD. Um, I have a varying degree of PTSD, not as severe as hers. Um, rightfully so probably because she's been through a lot more, um, losing her son and, and everything else that happened. But to bring up that conversation, it just was not, it never really felt like it was okay to do that. And my family, my extended family, my, you know, my grandmother and, and others, um, refused to talk about it. And, and, and they wouldn't even allow us to say Jacob's name around them because it would, it was just too upsetting for them. Um, so that was the first time. So last, I think it was, no, it was this January we sat down and we, we went through all of it, um, together and, and she was very open and she was very honest and, and her perspective of it was that she wanted me to have the whole story, uh, before she, before she died. And not that she's going to die anytime I soon, guess. but yeah, but she wanted, she wanted me to have the entire story and she wanted to answer my questions and it was a healing thing. It was hard. It was a hard conversation and we had to stop a couple of times because it was so emotional for both of us, but um, of course. yeah, she, she's amazing. I don't think people understand that when you lose a family member, it's not as if it's Thanksgiving dinner and you're all talking about it and it's well known. It, it kind of becomes this thing. I mean, from my personal experience, and it sounds like your experience that you kind of want to forget about in a certain aspect. It just becomes so sad yeah. that you don't want to relive it again and again and again until you feel that there is some need to get justice for that person. And then I'm sure you can, you can relate to living in that case after that. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about what that justice looks like? Like what happened with charges not being pressed? And then I, I, I know that there's all sorts of stuff in between, like him being arrested. Yeah. There was you getting the documents. There was, you know, it being reopened in 2005 and 2004. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if we could just talk a little bit about that and justice. Yeah, justice is, uh, you know, it's a concept that I used to have a lot of faith in and I used to believe in. And I thought that it was just, I've learned that that is not the case a lot of the time. Um, and even when people get their day in court, even then it's still probably not enough. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, I hope one day I'll figure it out, but until then I'm gonna keep fighting to, to get what I think is justice. But this whole thing, uh, it's insane. Um, so after they do the interviews, you know, he's obviously suspect number one. They, they believe he's responsible. Uh, the evidence shows that he's responsible. And he is scheduled for a polygraph test. Oh, oh, oh not recently. I'm sorry. At, at this point in time. Yeah, this was, I got way too yeah, excited. this is, <laughs> well, and I got excited reading the case file too, but it's going to be like ups and downs here. So I'm reading the investigation and something happens in the middle of it where one of the detectives runs into uh, the polygraph examiner's office and says, Hey, guess what? You guys, you don't have to, to administer a polygraph. He just confessed. Yeah. Okay. You guys um, so just kind of, yeah. So, so just kind of hold that in your mind while we're talking about all of this. Um, then for some reason, a polygraph is administered. I remember 
uh, driving up to Santa Fe with my mom and him in the car to go have this polygraph test given to him. I remember that day. And he comes out like nothing happened. He gets in the car, starts driving. My mom said, so what happened? He says, oh, nothing, I passed. So we believed him. Sure. Um, you know, then we kind of go through the whole thing where they got married and then there's all the abuse and everything that happened. Uh, they, they separate. My mom goes to the DA, asks the DA to reopen it. Like I talked about, he doesn't want to. Um, so she feels kind of lost and doesn't know what to do. We all start to feel this kind of hopelessness and dread because this man is not only free and not only was he never charged, but now he's stalking us. And he would come to my bedroom every night and knock on my window and tell me that he was going to kill and me. This is after your mother and I was got so the scared. Annulment. I'm sorry. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. yeah. After the annulment. Which she got because it, the abuse was so apparent that they just annulled. Yeah. Which is insane to me. Yeah. Well, and there's so many police reports. I have copies of all of them, of them, of the police coming to our house to uh, deal with the domestic violence issues that were happening. No charges were ever filed. And my mom, I mean, if you saw her then, she was so black and blue and swollen all the time. She just, there wasn't a time when she wasn't beaten up. And so we're in this kind of hopeless place where we feel like there's nothing we can do. The DA doesn't want to do anything. What do we do? Um, my mom starts petitioning to a bunch of people in the state. And she finally gets in 2005, the state police cold case investigation team to review the case. And that is included in the documents that I sent you, Sarah. And the investigator in his synopsis was very clear. There was no splitting hairs. He said, it's clear to me that Jacob's death happened one way not the three or four ways that this person gave in his stories and that he is responsible for it. Whether it's negligent or intentional, he was responsible. So I'm going to request that the district attorney open the case for prosecution. The district attorney sent a fax that said, we are not going to prosecute because of the statute of limitations, number one, which is bullshit forgive me, no but it is needed. Okay. <laughs> um, because the statute of limitations, because there is not enough evidence to prosecute him. And it was like being built up to this whole thing. And then just, you know, your balloon gets popped. Um, of course he confessed. Twice, confessions? We found out. Yeah. And we found out through that process that he did fa he in fact failed the polygraph. He never yeah. passed it. Um, so the cold case investigator says that there is no record of the confession. There's no written or recorded record of his confession. And they, they go to the length to mention um, that they don't know the conditions in which he confessed to either which in my mind is almost mm -hmm. like preemptively defending him. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm not a legal expert, um, but I am enraged for you because if I would have read that in my own case, I, oh, I, I would have flipped out. Um, so that's what scares me too with those confessions is that they're like, and, and we don't know how or, you know, under what condition he confessed. Um, so I just wanted to plug that in there because that was one thing that really stood out to me with those and made me mad. Yeah, I... You know, I don't think it's really, it doesn't make any sense. And and then the fact that nothing, is, there's no evidence, like how, how do I have copies of all this stuff? I have everything. How does the DA not have that? Where did it go? That's a good question. Do you have a theory on that? Does he have connections in the police department, friends? <laughs> so, um, Socorro, New Mexico is a very small town. Uh, when I was six, it was probably about 10,000 people mm -hmm. total. Um, you can't really go to the restroom without everybody knowing about it in that town. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Everybody is related 
to everybody. Gotcha. And it's pretty common. A lot of these guys he played basketball with, they hung out together. Um, the police in, in Socorro. Um, he was a maintenance worker for the county. He had keys to every building in the county, including the district attorney's office. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. Mm-hmm. That I'm. Mm, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm. I'm not saying that that he did anything in the DA's office, but I wouldn't right. put it past him. Neither would I. I don't have any proof of it. That and that's such a hard spot in cases like this is that you have all this circumstantial evidence, if you will. You have the means, motive, and opportunity, and for whatever reason, it's not enough. It's 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 insane and. So for the DA to say that there's no evidence, it just blows my mind. That's the first problem. The second problem is, um, I guess there used to be a statute of limitations on murder in New Mexico, which I is can't. stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, but even even though there was, I think that some of these uh, statutes, as they've been reversed, have been grandfathered in to you know be retroactive. Yeah. Yeah. So murder is murder is one of them, but I don't know if child abuse resulting in death negligently caused is one of them. I don't know if that's been retroactively right. you know removed. I mean it shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean I just think statute of limitations need to go away. Well, in general and uh, yeah and for child abuse there's so many things that in the legal system that i feel really tie up cases that are so obvious because in my mind this seems extremely obvious you have two confessions you have the hospital staff saying what they feel as a parent they have this doctor saying most people don't act like this gentleman who brought in this abused baby there's so many professionals it's not just you and your mom saying this it's every professional that has been involved in this case says that it points one way um and how they just ignore mm -hmm. that is is so scary to me um so yeah whether it's you know corruption which is totally possible i'm saying that not eric you can blame that on me um you know or it's just being lazy <laughs> it's it's hard to say yeah best case scenario is they're negligent in their job and and their election of duty that's like the best case scenario worst case scenario is they conspired with him to make sure that he wasn't charged either way it's horrible Absolutely. a nine-month-old baby died at his hands how can you with any conscious just let that happen and let him continue to live his life and who knows what he did to other people because of their inaction. Like it just, uh, it makes me so of angry. It does. Well, and they're setting the precedent that people can get away with this, which is terrible. And you mentioned in your podcast that New Mexico is like the third worst in terms of child abuse. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, it's, uh, it's continued to, to happen. And, you know, there's horrible examples of it. Um, there's so many kids that die at the hands of abusive people in this state. And there's a case going on right now uh, for Victoria Martins. I don't know if you've heard of that case. It's horrible. Um, it's not for the weak of stomach or heart. But um, one of her perpetrators was not only released on his own recognizance pending trial, but the stipulation that he's not to be around children has just been released this week. So now he's allowed to be around kids. That is so scary. That is absolutely insane to me. Well, and especially in, in your stepfather's case too, he has other children, which we don't have to mention. I'm sure it's not their fault in any way or whatever, but to know that not only when, you know, he abused you and your mom and then he left and, and went and continued to have his children and possibly grandchildren. And who knows, you know, after 30 years or whatever, like that's just, it, it's so scary yeah. that the laws against child abuse are not stronger. Um, I mean, I've been repeatedly told that because I don't have the victim here, Alyssa, that there can't be child abuse charges. And it's like, what do you do? What do you mean? Like if, if the child's gone, you just can't press charges and that person just gets away with it. Like it's so easy 
to manipulate and get rid of a child more so I would say than, than an adult. So yeah, why those protections aren't there is insane to me. It's, um, it's something that needs to change and, and I'm going to advocate for those changes in, in this state. And, and part of the reason why I created my show was to bring a light to all of this because, you know, this stuff is horrible. Nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, people who have been through it don't want to talk about it, but that's why it continues to happen. And so until people like me, people like you are willing to stand up and say that this is fucked up and it's wrong and it needs to stop, these people are going to continue to do this to everybody they come in contact with. And I have decided that it's ending with me. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to carry on this legacy of horror, you know, that he created and whatever happened to him that created that in him, it's not going to continue. And people need to be held accountable for what they do. Absolutely. My goodness. Well, and you know, that cycle of abuse is terrifying because it can go on for generation after generation after generation. And people just think it's normal. They think it's okay. They think this is the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I, I love that you're fighting for that. And obviously it's very close to you. You're getting very emotional and I completely understand why. Um, so it makes total sense why you started your podcast. Um, which do you want to talk a little bit about your podcast and, and give it a little plug and everything and show them your shirt and, and all that? <laughs> sure. And then if anybody has questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Um, like I said, you can, you can listen to the episodes about Jacob. There's three of them on my show, true consequences, which is available wherever you find podcasts. And it's even on YouTube. Um, my show is is all about crime in New Mexico and justice in New Mexico with a little bit of weird stuff that happens thrown in there for uh, my own entertainment more so than anything else, uh, just because it gets so heavy talking about all of this. I do interview a lot of victims' families uh, on my show. Uh, I am very passionate about the justice system here and about making changes to it. And you'll hear that a lot in my episodes. You'll hear them hear me talk about what's wrong with the justice system a lot. Um, and th that's only because I want to educate people in my state about what's going on here and hopefully get people to start thinking critically when they're voting, when they're electing people, um, rather than voting for the person that talks a good talk and has the perfect smile, you know, really look at what they stand for because they impact people's lives in ways that you can't even imagine until it happens to you. And unfortunately, legislators don't think about their impact unless something has personally affected them. Uh, it's just human nature. So uh, that's, that's the main reason why I'm doing my show. You know, I got really angry, Sarah, when somebody commented about you uh, wanting to get rich off of your sister's story. Somebody said the same thing to me about my brother and it, it really cut me deeply. Um, and, and I got so angry for you and I wanted to figure out who that was to go after them because like, they don't understand, you know, like I, this doesn't matter. I don't care. Like I'm in the red on this venture and I don't care. It's not about money for me. It's about justice. That's all oh that goodness. matters. I had that in my notes to bring um, it up because I saw it. Um, I, I heard you talk about it on your podcast and I got angry for you. So we're, we're in the same boat. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not okay. Like we're allowed to yeah. tell our stories just as much as any other medium. Like, why is it okay that somebody on YouTube or somebody in a larger podcast or whatever can run ads on their, you know, podcast about our family members. But when we do it, all of a sudden we're greedy and we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like people don't think that right. maybe we're fed up with hearing all these different renditions, um, despite being extremely grateful. I'll put that out there, but that, you know, fed up in the sense <laughs> that we want to go into the detail that we want to go into. We want to focus on the issues that we feel important, that other people may not feel important or touch right. on things that people won't like police corruption. I'm sorry, but you know, prior to this Black Lives Matter movement, which is amazing and, and coming up and, it, you know, is so big right now. Prior to that, I cannot tell you how many times I have been told that my story won't be covered because they won't touch the police aspect of it. Um, so I think that that's one thing that people really don't consider. And it it really is hurtful. And, 
just awful to see people like us be discouraged from telling our own damn stories. Like, it makes no yeah. sense. Yeah, it's our story exactly. to tell. Exactly. And your mom's 100%. story to tell. Like, I, I have not been that moved by an interview in a very long time. And when I heard your mom get emotional, like, it was it for me. And I was, like, in a weird way, like, jealous that you had that parent that would come speak on your podcast. And, like, it was just so moving to me to have, you know, to see you have all that support. And it was so cool. And I don't think that another creator could get that same thing on their podcast. You just don't elicit the same reaction. Thank you. That's, that's really sweet. And, uh, you know, I, I am, am happy to support you as much as I can. And, and I continue to uh, share Alyssa's story and, and back you up and, and just know I have your back. We don't know each other, you know, face to face. We know each other virtually, but, um, I have a lot of love in my heart for you and for your sister and for their for her case, oh and gosh, I hope it gets Erica. solved. And I hope Erica, you get justice. You get justice, my goodness. And let's be clear: you supported me before I supported you. I came on your podcast, and you ran Alyssa's story, and it's been a long time, and now I'm just finally doing it. Um, so I think that you're amazing, and like I text you, and there's no pressure because it's <laughs> on a live stream or whatever right now. I do want to do. Probably, I mean, probably more than one episode on the Voices for Justice main podcast feed because it deserves it. And it deserves more than a live stream where I'm distracted looking at notes and I'm distracted trying to answer people's questions, which is fine and great. That's what live streams are for. But I, I, it deserves more than that. It deserves a full produced uh, few episodes from me. So I really hope that I can do that for you. And I hope that this live stream is doing that for you now, um, which speaking of people on YouTube are asking how to find you on YouTube. Um, so it's Eric Carter Landin, uh, E R I C C A R T E R dash L A N D I N. Um, but I think you could search True Consequences, and you you'll probably find me there as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's the best way. You can also find me on TrueConsequences.com. You yes. asked me to talk about the shirt I'm wearing, so I will show everybody. Uh, the shirt is Justice for Jacob. It's pretty simple design. <laughs> Yeah, over there. <laughs> uh, sorry to point the camera. Totally across, fine. We saw the shirt. That's all that to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are these are for sale on my on my website. It's actually on T Public as well, uh, and I'm donating half of the proceeds to uh, the New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and I'm using the rest of the money to continue funding True Consequences podcast so that I can continue getting people's stories out there. Uh, that need to tell their stories. So uh, your support would mean everything. Um, hashtag justice for Jacob. You know, if you if you can help me sharing his petition and uh, signing the petition, that would help a lot. Sharing his story would help a lot. Um, it, people need to know what happened. It's been hidden and in the dark for 33 years, and it's past time for I him to have justice. More. And you also have a Patreon, don't you? Yeah, so go sign up for his Patreon. I do. Please support him. It's not easy, and it's not necessarily <laughs> fun doing a podcast about your family. I'm not going to lie. It's, I don't know about you, but I feel driven to do it because it feels like the right thing to do. It's not because I'm waking up every day excited about views and, like you said, any type of money or any type of fame. It's like a, a drive that comes within that you do even if it wasn't being monetized, even if nobody was watching it, I feel like I'd still be doing the same thing. And I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Do you, do you feel the same yeah. way? A hundred percent. You know, I started this show thinking that nobody would want to yeah. listen to it. And, um, you know, it's, it's growing. It's become kind of a thing here in New Mexico, which is, is cool. Uh, but it's not about that for me. You know, it's about getting justice, not just for my brother, but for so many in New Mexico that are left without answers. So many in New Mexico that are forgotten, um, especially the children that are forgotten. It's just a huge problem. It needs to change. And if no one's going to talk about it, then I'm going to talk about it. Even if it costs me thousands of dollars, even if it costs me relationships, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to stop. The same way. We are, we are linked in such a cool way, Eric, and I appreciate you so much. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on is I felt like when I did a, well, 
I'm still doing Alyssa's story, but as doing it, it, it feels very therapeutic. It's like you, oh, somebody just asked, has it been therapeutic for you to create these very personal podcasts? <laughs> yes, me, it has. Um, so I wanted to ask you this yes. question. I, I'm assuming yes. Yeah, it, it has, you know, that conversation with my mom was probably one of the most healing things that I've ever done for myself, just because it answered so many questions that I had that, you know, there were there were things that you just start to make up in your mind because you don't know, um, or you start to question over and over again. And so that answered a lot for me, but it also, I felt like created some, um, some healing. I don't know. It sounds woo woo, but I totally agree. That's what no, it felt like, like. You know, I connected with family members I hadn't spoken to in 20 years since I was a kid. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know and that, um, you know, that my father in particular uh, lied to me about. So, yeah, I think it's a totally different experience. It's like you learn about your own life through these police reports. It's like this unreal thing that you don't expect. Yeah, getting that objective view into your life is is bizarre, but very clarifying. Yeah, you I mean, know, clarifying, on a lot a of levels. Raging, depending on what you're reading, because um, it's hard to see that unfold yeah. in a way that you didn't expect it to, or a way that um, doesn't feel right to you. Which I think both of our cases went that way. You read these case documents, and they kind of end in, well, we couldn't do X, Y, and Z because of this, and it hurts, and it doesn't feel good. Yeah. And when I saw that he confessed, like I was done. I was like, this is, I can't believe this. I was so mm -hmm. mad. I was shaking. I, how, exactly. how is he not in jail? How do you confess to murdering a baby and you're not in jail? Like, that's just, I cannot tell you when, <sighs> when I sat with the police and I was like, I have two near confess, which I'm sure aren't even on the same scale as the confessions that, you know, you have there. But when I had these two near confessions, I literally said to them, so can I just start confessing to like every murder ever and you're not going to arrest me? Like you, that's how you feel. You feel like this insane person where you're like, what do you mean all evidence points this way? What do you mean there's a confession and nothing happens? How do people get away with this? Why is it so fucking easy to get away with murder? Because it is. I'm sorry. It is. Yeah, it is. I, you know, I, you hit the nail on the head there, Sarah. You start to question your own sanity. I have been there for so long. Like I'm looking at everything and I'm like, how am I the only one that is enraged about this? How am I the only one that thinks this is wrong? Why is nobody doing anything about it? What is like, I want to shake the police. I want to shake the DA. Exactly. I just and don't it's understand this weird, it. Like you want to be careful and you're a little timid about it. You don't want to release everything because you don't want to hurt the case because once you become really public about it, yep. the police kind of start looking at you as like the enemy as crazy. Even if, you know, you're just regurgitating their own information. Yes. Then they're like, well, why their would you words, say that? Yeah. You're like, well, why would you release this as a public record then? I don't like if the whole world can know, why can't I say it on my podcast or whatever? Like, what's the deal? You gave me the file. Yes. Oh you redacted gosh. the file. Oh my gosh. What do you want me Jillian to do? Jillian says we are enraged <laughs> with you. Yes. And I, be, I, I'm always careful about saying I'm mad. Right. Cause that's like something they can use in court. They'll ask you like that made you mad. Didn't it? And you're like, no, I'm just, it, it's just, it's, it's yes. It's upsetting and it's frustrating it's right. and it's confusing um, yeah. because when you grow up, you know, you're told, do the right thing. Tell the truth. Go tell a teacher, which then in turn, you know, you see mm -hmm. something, you say something, you go to the police. And then you just see these cases time and time again where people are trying to do the right thing and report these things. And they just don't turn out the way that you were told they would when you're growing up. Like, it's just really, really disturbing yeah. and upsetting. Um, we have a few minutes left. Was there anything else that you wanted to include or anything that I may have missed, which I'm sure is a lot. Again, there's so much detail. Please go to his podcast through consequences, but is there anything else you would like to say? Um, I just want to say thank you, Sarah. This is a, a huge blessing. I don't know what else to say. Um, I look up to you and I admire you so much and it means a lot that you invited me onto your show and I, yeah, um, I can't I say thank you enough. Show anytime you want. Um, and I definitely want to interview <laughs> you, like I said, for the main podcast feed and really go more in depth to those documents because you were so lovely to send me 
like the 200 pages and I was able to skim through them, but not as in much detail as I'd like. Um, so yeah, I want to have you guys back on. People are saying wonderful things about you in all the comments, which I, I'm so sorry. I'm again, I'm like so bad at these comments. Um, yes. If there's any questions, I can yeah, answer them please, in please. the last couple and minutes. there's like no time limit. Like I have nowhere to go. It's fine. Um, it, <laughs> And this is yeah, your, here. your time. <laughs> um, so I see some questions about me, but I'm not going to answer questions. Go ahead, Zoe. Case. It's, let's, um, let's focus on Jacob. So yes, Miss Zoe. Zoe says she has a question. We're like, what is it? When I realized about my stepdad. Um, like when I realized that he killed my brother, is that, is that what you're asking? Okay, uh, because, you know, I, I think when I when my brother died and we had the funeral and everything, I, I didn't really know what was happening. I was very confused. I was obviously very sad. And shortly after that, I remember we were driving to my grandparents' house. It was my mom, my stepdad, and I. And my grandfather comes busting out of the house, storming towards the car. And he starts threatening my stepdad. And he says, why don't you hit somebody who can talk? And that was the moment I realized that my stepdad was responsible. I'm, you're a perceptive kid. You're yeah. a very perceptive kid. That probably would have went right over my head at that age. Um, but yeah, and I think that, which of course I'm sure it's not easy to talk about, but I think that, you know, the, the abuse that you and your mom suffered was, was pretty downplayed. You know what I mean? Like when I heard the story about you, you know, sleeping with a can of hairspray and a lighter and a knife under your pillow as a small child, and to hear about you busting through your window, breaking out the screen, when you heard your mom stop screaming after she was being abused for quite some time, she stopped screaming and you bust out of your window and throw rocks at it. Um, and she says that you saved her life. Like it's, I like have goosebumps right now because the abuse seemed pretty, pretty rough. It wasn't just a mean stepdad. It was extremely abusive. Yeah, he, um, he terrorized us. You know, we lived in constant fear. I couldn't make eye contact with him without him beating my mom up because I was giving him dirty looks. Um, so I, I did sleep with all of that under my pillow because I was afraid for my life and I was willing to do whatever it took to survive at that point. And that was about three years of every day. And another thing that kind of I started talking about was how manipulative he was. There was an Easter picnic we were going to go to as a family and he had beat my mom up so badly that she was almost unrecognizable and he lined me and his kids up and he was walking back and forth like a drill sergeant saying if somebody asks what happened to your mom what are you going to say over and over and over again until we got the story right she fell off a motorcycle she got in a wreck that's why she's beat up and if we didn't sound convincing enough he would keep us there for as long again, as it took until we did against him for domestic violence, which is nope. just insane. Nope. And I know you're, you're, you said that your mom no record. documented everything. You said that you, um, you go on about it a little bit and I'm so impressed by your mom. I will, I will never stop singing your mom's praises. Um, but I'm so impressed that she had the foresight to do that because to her credit, that's exactly what they do in court, right? They say, Oh, you were hit. Okay. When, what day, where exactly what time. And it's like, who the hell thinks to do that until you go through that awful experience, then you realize nobody's going to believe me unless I have crazy amounts of documentation. Um, so I, yeah, between her being so, yeah. yeah we have tons of so notebooks like, no, of no her notes. Um, I have, let me see, Mandy on Facebook is asking, yep. what do you think it will feel like when you find justice for Jacob? I know. That's a really tough question. I think you probably yeah. would have a hard time answering that as well, Sarah. <laughs> um, you know, in one of my episodes, my friend Edna asks me what justice looks like. And she's really pushing me to to talk about, you know, 
is it is it a day in court is it is it him going to prison what is it and i i have a hard time with that um i want to think that it's going to feel good but i don't know that that's going to be what happens i think it's going to feel like a lot of things i think i'm still going to be angry about it i think i'm still going to be sad about it i think all of those feelings are going to come up at the same time and um i will be i don't know if happy is the right word i will be proud if that happens i will be proud of the effort that my mom and i did to to make it happen i'll be proud of fighting for jacob um but i don't know that I i'll ever that be happy you. about um, it but first of all you should be proud you should already be proud um because what you're doing is not easy and your podcast is very well produced and you do it all by yourself is that correct same <laughs> Yeah, and you'll see the you're progression fine. of how horrible it was in the um, beginning. One to, thing, which I know, know. It's like, obviously, <laughs> none of what we talk about is funny or okay, but you know, you see us both laughing because, hi, we have to live with this. It's been a long time, and some of these things yeah. are laughable. But in your second episode, of, you guys are in a restaurant and you're talking about you know these horrible things, and I could not help but sympathize with you because I have had mm -hmm. those very public conversations where all of a sudden you're talking about like death and like people killing each other or whatever, and you know even like you know decom decomposition and things like that, and then you know I would have this moment of like I'm in public, like uh, wait a second, um, but it, but it's such a double edged sword. Like, do you feel that same way? Like it's kind of like I'm in public, but this is my life, so oh yeah, deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm already talking about it publicly anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah, I got a little uncomfortable when Edna started talking about the rate of decomposition on an infant. I'm like, oh, people are eating breakfast well, right like now. Like, this is very in the background at one point. Um, but, you know, again, I just there's those moments where you just don't think about it. You know, you especially in my case, you know, when I interviewed family members and stuff and the audio wasn't perfect, I was not about to go ask them to do another six hour interview because the audio wasn't perfect. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. Um, so I'm sure you felt that same sentiment. Yeah, I did. I, you know, the audio was in that second episode was terrible because we were in a very loud crowded restaurant. And I just said, you know what, this is, this is what happened. This is, this is where it was. I took as much of the background noise out as it's I could. It's not terrible. I've used but... worse audio, trust me, um, because sometimes you're just in that situation. And again, you're not going to go ask those people to like relive that moment because the audio is not perfect. It's just. Well, yeah, and you're not going to ask your dad to to talk to you again at Starbucks because, yeah. you know, oh my gosh. that audio was not so terrible I got, either, I got some by comments the way. playing with the cup. Like, yeah, I can't be like, you know, dad, you were playing with you know, that cup, when you told me, you'd tell me on your deathbed, can you just say that one more time and, and put the cup down? Like, exactly. <laughs> can you talk but into like, the phone? <laughs> I don't know. I love that we're doing what we're doing. And I think it's a cool, very new thing to podcasting. And I, for one, like really real audio and real audio is not perfect, you guys. Yeah. We are not in a studio half the, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I am not in a studio interviewing these people i'm in my living room i'm at a starbucks you are at a restaurant I'm um <laughs> i'm in an, an office with junk behind me or whatever this is not where i record um truth be told i record in my walk-in closet um because it has the best audio but um i obviously like can't bring guests in there so you know um <laughs> but again I, I think it's really cool what you're doing and the fact that you said that like i inspired you like i almost started crying um because i think that there's a like you know to your point about getting justice and it not feeling great, I think, you know, after getting justice, um, it's like motivating. Like you want to go on and help other people. Like you're like invigorated and you're like, I can do this. Look what I did. Yeah. I've done this, this much. How can I help everybody on the planet? That's, that's how I feel. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that it's not going to stop with Jacob. It's going to only, that's just the beginning. Um, I'm, I want to help more people. I want to have more new Mexicans on my show to tell their stories because I think that that is powerful. And I think we have an opportunity with this platform and with your platform to provide people a place where they can tell their story fully and in their own words without having to have some kind of angle or slant 
or to be over edited so that it changes the meaning and the context. That's a gift to be able to give to victims' families that I don't take lightly. And when I interview victim families, I try to not talk that much because I want them to be able to say what's oh, on their heart because the it's their story. I think when I interview, like even yeah. interviewing you, um, you know, which I don't, this isn't really like a formal interview. I feel like it's very much a discussion. Um, but I, like I told you, like, I got so nervous. Like, yeah. I feel like I've been interviewed in so many different ways. Some ways I like, some ways I didn't. And it's like, I'm trying to think of this combination of things when really I should just like trust my gut and be a person. Um, but telling, you know, telling your story is not something I take <laughs> lightly. Um, so I appreciate you, de you know, dealing with me. I'm not, I'm not perfect at interviewing other families at this point, um, but you are amazing. And I appreciate everything you do. I think you did a great job. And just so you know, I was just Aww. as nervous interviewing you. <laughs> I was so scared because I'm like, oh my God, I just love oh her show God. so much. You I don't want to so mess up sweet. this story. I've, I found someone so. like me. What is this life? Oh my gosh. Cause it's not easy. <laughs> and, and I know we're not going to see each other this year at the true crime podcast festival, but I look forward to seeing you next yes, year there yes, they just changed and the meeting dates. in person. Yes. Um, so it's, I believe like the Hopefully. 4th of July weekend or July 1st through 3rd, I think, right. 20, uh, 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we will do yep. that. Um, but yeah, yep. if anybody has any other questions, please submit them now. Um, you see Robin says should have online crime con too. They did an online crime con thing, um, but I was not involved. So I don't know what they're going to do right now. Crime con is still on for Halloween weekend, which Eric, oh my goodness. If you could get there, please do. Um, if I, I did request to be oh, a podcast I, on there, so but I haven't heard like back. that incentive program, right? If you sell so many tickets, you can get other, uh, like other tickets and other hotel rooms and stuff. So maybe if I get enough, I can just like smuggle you in. And you, I mean, I don't care. You can like literally sit at my booth. Like, <laughs> it would be nice to have somebody like that knows. Like, as bad as that sounds, and obviously it's terrible. And I wish you didn't know or whatever. Yeah. And I'm sure you wish I didn't know. Um, it's nice to have you, and you're super cool and wonderful, and in it for the right reasons. Thank you. Well, it's good to feel like you're not alone because you you can feel that way doing this um, and going through something like what we've gone through it's easy to feel isolated and like nobody understands and people look at you like you have three heads because of the weird stuff that's happened. Yeah. Um, you, so it's good to have that family connection. and all of a sudden feel like, Oh no, they don't want to see me. They think it's all I'm going to talk about. Um, Cause I have that. Like whenever I go to anything family, I'm like, hi, like I, I try not to talk about it. Um, Cause I feel like that's what they think we're going to do. Yeah, well, I wore my Justice for Jacob shirt to my grandmother's house the other day, and she like she almost fell over. She was so <laughs> shocked by it, and I felt really bad. Uh, but I, yeah, so <laughs> I try weird. not to bring it it's up. So weird. <laughs> I agree because it's like, awkward. There's so many people online right now, you know, that are like they love yeah. us talking about it. Somebody says we should partner up and do some cases, which I agree. Um, but yeah, it's different when it comes to family, you know. I think, and we touched on that about you know how nobody really wants to talk about it. Or at least a lot of people don't. They kind of want it to. They want to heal, which I get. Yeah. Which I totally get. Yeah. When yeah, you're this close, you don't have a choice. You have I am to so deal proud with of it. You for doing. Thank you. I'm proud of you. And I'm so excited with the news that you shared publicly uh, recently. That's amazing. And I hope that it continues progressing in the way that it needs to. Um, if you're watching on my Facebook feed and you have not listened to Voices for Justice, <laughs> there's like, you have to do it. You don't have a choice. I'm not going to give you an out on that. It's an, it's a great show and Alyssa's story is heartbreaking. So I know your listeners are listening too. sorry guys. Indulge me while you're I so plug sweet. Sarah you're for so a minute sweet. to my um, people. <laughs> no, thank you. And yeah, I, let me see. Fern is asking if I thought about doing other cases alongside Voices for Justice. Yes, absolutely. And, and including Jacob's case for sure. That's the whole point. Voices for Justice was never supposed to be about Alyssa. Um, but it came to that point where I felt like it, you know, we needed that extra push to get this prosecution moving forward after it was sitting there for about six months. I just, I could not stand it any longer. 
Um, but thank you again, Eric. Um, I want to tell people again, of course, please go listen to True Consequences podcast. Like literally, even before you listen to it, please go give him a um, nice five-star review so that he can go up in the ranks and the ratings. That is very, very important, more important than you guys think. <laughs> Um, so yeah, please subscribe. Please go follow him on social media. I will be sure to post all of the links. This video will be available afterwards. Um, yeah. Oh, somebody says they're looking at pictures of your brother on Facebook. He's an adorable, adorable kid. He was so cute. And my son, I found a picture of my son around the same age and they look exactly the same, except my son is bald. Yeah, you sent me Jacob that has a full head of hair. I was like, it's oh really my gosh, cute. like he looks <laughs> so similar. Um, I have a niece that looks just like Alyssa. So I, I yeah. feel for you. You see it and it's like happy and nostalgic and kind of sad. Um, but sorry, we could gush over each other all night. And I like, I like keep like ending it and then not ending it. So I know it's, yeah, they hate us. They hate us. It's gross. Everybody hates us. We'll just us make now. a whole podcast of us <laughs> gushing over each other. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Sarah, again, thank you. We can wrap it up um, unless anybody has any questions. But if not, we might as well just just end it. And um, I'm looking forward to working with you more in the future. And You're amazing. Of thank course. you thank again. You as well. You're um, amazing. Yes, I'll be in contact. So thank you again for coming on. All right. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night.